come out of your day. Um, so as you can see, this is joined with Tobias. Uh, he's also in the audience and he's going to be answering questions in the chat. Uh, and it's a relatively new project. Uh, we just started presenting this maybe four to six weeks ago. Um, and so we're really interested in all kinds of feedback. We think there are many more things we can do with this. So let me uh, set the stage kind of at a very high level and just remind everyone why do we care so much about the pricing kernel. Um, and it's the standard textbook result or the fundamental equation that says, uh, if there's no arbitrage, then the pricing kernel prices everything. And one way to express this is to say, I can write down a one factor model with the pricing kernel being the only factor uh, that explains the returns of every asset. Okay. Um, so really understanding asset prices boils down to understanding the properties of M. Now this result is theoretically very elegant, but it's practically not very useful because the pricing kernel can't be observed. And so what we really do, uh, we do different things. Uh, so one thing we do is we try to connect the pricing kernel to properties of assets. Uh, so for example, the Hansard Jake and Eisenbaum tells us that uh, the pricing kernel is, is very volatile. We can infer this from uh, the maximum Sharpe ratio across assets in the economy. Um, so it tells us something about the properties of M. It doesn't really make M, M observable. In an, another angle that many people take is obviously to write down fact, linear factor models for returns. Uh, and these models in turn imply that the pricing kernel itself is linear in the factors. Uh, and what we have probably learned there is that there's more than one factor that affects the pricing kernel, at least if you believe in this linear structure. Now, of course, a lot of uh, work goes into finding out what are those factors and, and how many are there. If you work in macro finance, like I usually do, then uh, the way to understand the pricing kernel would be to write down a structural model uh, and to relate it to uh, properties of investors' risk preferences and maybe macroeconomic risks. And in this case, the pricing kernel is a function maybe of consumption growth. Uh, and if you believe in Epstein's end preferences, then perhaps there are some other economic state variables like long run risks or time running disaster probabilities that enter through this later term. Okay, and then the, the final angle, and that's the angle that most of you will be most familiar with, is kind of the derivatives angle, um, which looks at the pricing kernel's projection onto returns. Uh, and in this case, we typically express it as the ratio of some option implied probabilities to real world probabilities. And what this measures is really the expected pricing kernel conditional on two things. Uh, so conditional on the future return realization. So it's gonna be a function of returns uh, and conditional on investors information set at time T. So in a sense, we're projecting down a multivariate pricing kernel, for example, uh, as you can see here and here, these are both expressed as functions of multiple variables. We're going to project this down onto market returns and ask just how does it vary as a function of returns. Okay. To have a more compact notation, I'm going to use this little m here uh, to denote the log of the projected pricing kernel. Um, and in this paper, we do two things. Okay, so the first thing is empirically, uh, we're going to follow a relatively standard approach of measuring this, but we're going to pay very particular attention to the t here. So the T is where the volatility is going to live. And we're going to argue that the shape of the pricing kernel changes very substantially as a function of volatility. That's going to be the empirical part of the paper. Uh, and then we're going to try to take this finding and try to learn something about the mechanisms of equilibrium models. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at pricing kernels such as this one. And we're going to project it down onto returns the same way it would, would be done in the data. Uh, and we're going to compare what the behavior of this projected kernel looks like in the models relative to the data. And then we're going to try to trace it back to assumptions about preferences and macroeconomic risks. Okay, so here's our main finding in one slide. Um, so in all three panels, I'm going to plot the projected pricing kernel. Again, my notation here, M of R, is the log of the projected pricing kernel. Uh, it's a function of returns, in this case, monthly stock market returns. Um, and the two lines represent uh, two separate estimates. They are medians for periods where volatility is very high or volatility is very low. And so the, the pattern you can see here, and I'm going to try to convince you it's robust, significant, et cetera, is that when stock market volatility is very low, the pricing kernel is very steep as a function of returns, and vice versa, when volatility is very high, the pricing kernel is very flat as a function of returns. Um, 
So I think this fact is interesting in itself and it's related to a lot of things a lot of you have worked on, I know this. Um, what is also interesting is to compare it to the equivalent uh, um, um, pricing kernel projection in the models. And you can see, for example, in the habit model, uh, that there's also a gap The pricing kernel also moves with volatility, but it actually moves in the opposite direction. And I'm gonna dive deep into the mechanism later on, but the very standard intuition is risk erosion goes up in a recession. Therefore, the pricing kernel becomes steeper and recessions also tend to be times where volatility is, is elevated. So that's the intuition for why this goes in the other direction. And you can see in the longer risk model, the pricing kernel actually does not move as a function of volatility. Uh, and the same will be true for a bunch of other models that we're going to look at later. Okay, so what we're going to do with this uh, uh, conflicting evidence or these, these uh, different shapes is to argue that actually these models rely on this behavior in order to explain both the equity premium and return predictability. I'm going to try to argue that if the behavior wasn't there, they, the models would not be able to explain these things. All right, I'm going to skip this uh, to save some time. Um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to walk you through how we estimate things. Uh, then I'm going to show you a bunch of different robustness tests, basically different versions of estimating the same thing. Uh, try to convince you that it's statistically significant. Uh, and then we're going to take it to the models. So again, the object we would like to estimate is the one up here, um, which is the projection onto stock market returns. Uh, and there are a couple of different ways of doing this. So either we estimate risk neutral and physical probabilities and take their ratio, or, and that's what we will do, we will actually parameterize the pricing kernel itself. And now to do this, we still need an estimate of the option implied uh, density, uh, which is gonna be relatively standard. So we're gonna build on Breed and Litzenberger, take second derivatives, there's gonna be some interpolation, et cetera. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not gonna dive into the details, but I'm happy to come back to them later if, 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 if there are questions on this. Yeah, so then what we will do is we will write down a parametric function for this little m for the log of the projected kernel. So down here, I've written this as a function of returns and some parameter vector theta. And once you plug this in up here, you can solve this equation for the distribution of returns, the real world distribution, which we can't really observe. Okay, so now we have the option implied distribution. We back that out uh, based on options from Breed and Litzenberger. Uh, we have our parametric form for the pricing kernel. And any parameter vector theta is now going to map into a, a distribution, a real world probability distribution. Okay. Now, what that allows us to do, and that's where we differ a little bit from how previous papers have approached this that have also parameterized the pricing kernel is we're gonna, max, we're gonna just use maximum likelihood to estimate these parameters. Right. Once we have the conditional density, we can evaluate the likelihood. Uh, and so we're going to estimate the, the theta vector based on maximum likelihood, as opposed to, for example, uh, I think maybe six to eight weeks ago, there was a talk here where uh, somebody did something similar, but uh, did a moment-based estimation. Okay, that's an alternative. Uh, we're gonna just do MLE because we can, because we see the density. Okay. Um, one small uh, aside is we're gonna put in a penalty uh, and that penalty is just going to ensure that these densities actually integrate to one, uh, which would otherwise not be guaranteed if you just have an arbitrary functional form here. Okay, so the details will lie in how do we parameterize this pricing kernel? What's the functional form here? Okay. And in particular, I've told you that what I would like is to capture how does this pricing kernel change as a function of volatility? Uh, so the, whatever function I write down has to be able to accommodate changes with volatility. And so here's what we'll do. We'll write down a very simple polynomial. So the, uh, the, project, the log projected pricing kernel is gonna be a function of returns. Um, and time variation is going to come in through time varying coefficients of this polynomial. Okay. A couple of comments. Um, if you've worked with polynomials, you know that orthogonal polynomials are usually the way to go. Okay. Uh, things are easier to identify this way. Uh, the reason why we're gonna use a monomial basis here is gonna become apparent when I talk about the coefficients in a moment, just in case you're wondering this. Okay, um, okay. so these coefficients, uh, which are going to control time variation in the kernel are going to be a function of volatility and later on also of other economic state variables. Okay, but for now, just volatility. And we're gonna write down this very specific functional form here that's gonna turn out to be very important um, where, so this, para, this uh, coefficient theta, which there's one such coefficient for each term in the polynomial is gonna be just a constant CI, 
divided by some function of volatility. And this, you can see that this is a linear function of volatility scaled, or so, sorry, raised to the power i. It probably looks exotic. So let me explain why we choose this functional form, uh, mainly because it nests two very interesting cases. Um, so imagine, for example, um, that the parameter a here is one and b is zero, in which case the whole term on the bottom drops out. And in this case, theta would just be ci without at. There's no time variation. The dependence on volatility is killed. Okay. What that would mean is that the pricing kernel is a time invariant function of returns. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm going to be able to test this by looking at how well does this special case fit. Right? So if I, if I impose the parameter restriction 1, 0, it's going to be a time invariant function. On the other hand, and this is really why we chose the power i here, if I impose the restriction a is 0 and b is 1, then I'm dividing ci by volatility raised to the power i, which I can pull into the return to the power i. So in this case, this is a standardized return. It's the return divided by its conditional volatility raised to the power i. And the special case would be the pricing kernel is time invariant as a function of standardized returns. Okay, what that means is, as a function of returns, it's going to be highly time varying because I'm going to scale it basically the whole pricing kernel by volatility. Uh, that's going to be one other special case. And cases in between would be it varies a little bit, bit with volatility depending on what this parameter B is. And I can test formally does the pricing kernel vary with volatility by testing the hypothesis that B is equal to zero. Maybe. This may already be a good point to stop and ask if there are any questions here on this. So if you have any questions, right, there are none in the chat, but if anyone has a question now, they should feel free to shout it out. So maybe to foreshadow a little bit what's to come, I'm going to show you the estimation results, and then I'm going to show you that. Oh, uh, there is a write there, there is a question. Uh, do you impose that B is greater than zero? Uh, we do not impose it. No. Nope. So I'm going to show you estimation results now for three cases. One unrestricted case, B is going to turn out to be positive. Uh, and then these two restricted cases that say the pricing kernel is time invariant either as a function of simple returns or as a function of standardized returns. And we're going to just see what fits the data best. Okay, that's here. So I've basically just rewritten this here. I've combined uh, here's the CI and I've pulled everything else into the into the fraction here, which is raised to the power i. You can see that this was raised to the power i, so I can pull it in here. And again, there are three cases. The unrestricted case is the first one. And then the two restrictions, either I impose 0, 1 or 1, 0, uh, which I've just alluded to. And so we can compare, for example, the log likelihood. And this is just normalized by the number of observations. And of course, the, un the, the unrestricted case has the best likelihood. Okay, well, because it has most degrees of freedom. Uh, but you can see if I impose 0, 1, which means I'm just scaling returns by the volatility, the log likelihood actually barely drops. And if you look at a, a model selection criterion like the BIC, it actually says I prefer this restricted case. Okay, so the, the higher parsimony I get by throwing out these two parameters is actually worth it. It seems to fit the data almost as well, uh, even though I have two less uh, degrees of freedom here. But if I impose the alternative restriction and say, okay, let's get rid of the volatility scaling altogether, B is zero now, which means the pricing kernel does not move this volatility, the likelihood drops quite a bit and the BIC becomes worse as well. Okay, so this itself says the pricing kernel seems to depend on volatility. Uh, we can also just kind of test this hypothesis here, B is equal to zero, which means volatility doesn't matter. All right. Uh, and this we Sorry, so before you get too much further, let me jump in with a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so one, is the volatility in M, I think that's sigma, risk neutral or physical? And if the latter, how is it estimated? Um, it is risk neutral because we don't want to estimate it. It's just the VIX index. Okay, so because I would, prefer to not estimate, have an additional estimation of having a volatility model to estimate the conditional volatility. We just use the VIX. Wait a minute, but there's a risk premium. Isn't that incorrect? Well, it's a linear function of this, right? So as long as the risk premium is F high in, in volatility itself, that can be absorbed into the parameters A and B. And you can see that actually this doesn't play a big role 
Um, so yes, the VIX overestimates conditional volatility, but it seems like the fit is nearly as as, as good when I when I don't uh, scale with A and B here. Okay, so there was also a follow up question about the related to the earlier question about the sine of B. So the follow up question is: so if B is greater than zero, then the market price of market risk goes down at times of high vol. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So maybe I, I meant to say that at the beginning, but if you allow me to go back real quick. Um, mm -hmm. So one way to read this is a return of, let's say, minus 10%. Let's just fix a number. A return of minus 10% is much more painful to investors in marginal utility units. Uh, if it occurs when volatility is low, as opposed to when it occurs when volatility is high. Right, so in that sense, marginal utility risk prices change over time. Okay, Neil, other questions or should I go on? Let, well, yeah. please go on, no more questions right now. Yeah, I have one. Oh, there is um, one, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, how, how do you choose the number four, like uh, the I going to four? I see, uh, I will come to that in a second. Um, so there, there's a choice here. We have a fourth order polynomial. Uh, let me just tell you the answer. Uh, I'm, we're going to estimate it for every polynomial order. And four is going to be the one that's preferred by the BIC. So it's the, it's the best fit, essentially. So here's graphically, again, the result. Uh, so these five lines, we, we have an estimate of the pricing current on, in, on every day in our sample, the last 30 years, 7,500 observations. We're going to group them into five buckets based on the VIX low vol, medium vol, high vol. And then in each bucket, we're going to compute the median. Um, and so you can see that the finding you saw before, that when volatility is low, the pricing kernel is steeper. So here we don't really see time variation though, right? Because we've kind of averaged across periods. So I also want to show you how this looks in a time series, but I don't want to plot the curve as a, as a time series because that would be hard to look at. Uh, and so what we do instead is we'll measure the slope of the line. Okay, very uh, simplistic. We're going to measure a rise over run between minus 10 and zero. So we can see obviously the slope is steeper when uh, volatility is low. And I'm going to plot the slope over time. Just have to have, have another way of looking at the same thing. That's what we have done here. Uh, so the slope, again, measured between minus 10 and zero is plotted on top. The VIX index is plotted on the bottom. Uh, and you can see that they're fairly highly correlated. If you regress the slope on the VIX, uh, you get an R squared of 51%. Uh, and you get a highly significant slope. And that's bootstrapped and, and, and uh, clock bootstrap to take account, uh, in account of the fact that our data is actually overlapping. So I think that we have done this relatively cleanly. Uh, seems like it's significant. Um, and the other thing that you can that I can maybe point out is that it's not the case that there are some individual outliers that really drive our results. For example, 2008 doesn't look all that different from a large part of the sample over here and the part uh, that, that follows it. Right? So high volatility means the pricing kernel slope is close to zero, it's flat. Uh, but this is not at all unusual here. So it's not the case that it's driven by outliers. Okay, what I'll do next is I'll try to convince you that this finding is robust by showing you different alternative ways of estimating the pricing kernel. Uh, and I'm going to show you the likelihood. And what I'll also show you is I'll show you the slope coefficient here, because that's easy to summarize in a table for all kinds of other specifications. And I'm going to show you in every case, it's going to be highly significantly positive uh, uh, um, period. <laughs> um, okay, so first test, uh, and that was the question that was just asked. Uh, how did you choose the polynomial order? So here we go from order one, which is linear, to order five. Um, and in each case, you can see the log likelihood. You can see the BIC. For complete list, here's the number of parameters. It's going to be interesting in a second, because some other specifications are going to have many more parameters. Uh, and then I'm going to test, basically, is the slope coefficient here uh, less than zero or bigger than zero, but I'm uh, testing uh, one-sided. I'm testing is it less than zero, and this is going to be rejected very significantly. So the p-value is 0 0.0000 in all cases, uh, and the coefficient itself is positive in all cases. And you can see that it kind of stabilizes uh, after I allow for a little bit of non-linearity in the pricing curve. Okay, so the red number here is the BIC. Uh, order four is the pre preferred polynomial order. Okay, let me jump in with another question. Um, the question is, does the implied physical distribution look reasonable? Say, for example, 
is the implied physical distribution similar to what you'd get from a Garch model? Um, yes to the first question, no to the second question. So it looks reasonable in the sense that when we plot it, it looks like unimodal and smooth. Uh, I should have a plot here, but I don't. Um, it does not necessarily look like a Garch model. So the volatility obviously scales. Um, but if you have in mind a Garch model with normal innovations, the answer would be no, because this is going to allow for skewness and kurtosis. Uh, and that reminds me of one other thing that I wanted to point out, but didn't. So if I go back here. Um, so we specify this functional form here. And then basically what we do is we map the option implied distribution, which of course is skewed and uh, um, has excess kurtosis. We map this into the physical distribution, which means time variation in skewness that you see here is going to also be reflected here. So this is nice because we have a lot of information, obviously, in the risk neutral distribution. And I don't need to pick moments. I have the entire distribution in my information set. I map this to the P distribution and I maximize the likelihood. So the question is just how do I tilt this distribution? And because I assume a polynomial here, this is going to be a smooth tilt. So as long as the risk neutral distribution looks smooth and you tilt it with a polynomial, the resulting physical distribution will also look smooth. Yeah. Obviously, there's a parametric assumption here. Maybe it's not fully flexible. Um, but again, I'm going to show you it's robust. Other questions? Or should I go on here? No other questions right now. Okay, so I'm going to uh, um, speed up a little bit, but I'm going to show you the, the other robustness test. So second test is you may say, well, you have this really funky functional form here for the coefficients. Mm, I don't know if you maybe engineered this somehow. Okay, let's scratch this. Let's just write down a polynomial in volatility for the coefficient itself. Okay, so instead of using this, I'm going to write down a polynomial in volatility to parameterize these coefficients. Sorry for all the clicking. So I have this right here. Um, so that essentially means the pricing kernel is now a bivariate polynomial in volatility and returns. And I'm going to choose different orders of this coefficient polynomial. So it's now a nested polynomial. The coefficient of the polynomial is itself a polynomial, but it's very flexible. Um, and again, you can see um, that the, co the slope coefficient here is significantly positive in all cases. Um, you can also see that it takes actually quite a high polynomial order here until I get the same log likelihood as in the benchmark case. So for comparison, the log likelihood here, which is our benchmark specification, is 1.9031. In order to get this, I need at least a third order polynomial for the coefficients here. And in that case, I already have 20 parameters. Okay, so I would argue that means that our benchmark specification, where this data is the ratio, is a very parsimonious way of, cap of capturing the time variation that we actually see in the data. It fits as well as a specification that uses 20 parameters here. But again, the, the main takeaway is it is significant. So this slope coefficient is significant, meaning the slope of the pricing kernel is significantly positively related to volatility. OK, what about if there are other macro time series that also affect the shape of the, of the pricing kernel? Is it then still the case that volatility has a significant effect? Okay. So here, we'll, we'll use our old specification with the A plus B sigma but will allow the coefficient that sits up front to be also a function of some other variable x. And we consider three different variables, uh, the yield of a three months T-bill, the term spread, and a measure of the credit spread. These are all very standard series that we've taken from FRED. Uh, so kind of the standard data source for, for macro time series. Um, and you can see that it helps to have this in here. So the fit actually improves, both in terms of BIC and log likelihood. The fit is better. So if you really want to capture all sorts of variation, that's the way to go. But volatility still has a significant effect. This parameter is still positive, and we can still significantly we can still reject the hypothesis that it that it that it isn't that it's negative. In the paper, we also take this to higher orders. I don't have this tabulated here, but we have it tabulated in the paper. Uh, it's it goes through. Okay, force robustness. I don't like that you parameterize the pricing kernel. I like to estimate the physical distribution itself. Fine, let's scratch everything I've done. Okay, let's follow the, the approach from the pricing kernel puzzle literature. Okay, so we take this from options again. And instead of mapping anything and parameterizing the pricing kernel, I just estimate the conditional physical distribution. How do I do this? Let me choose, choose a parametric density, okay, a skewed T or a normal inverse Gaussian. What are those? 
they nest the normal, they allow for skewness and excess kurtosis. Um, and I'm going to allow the parameters again. Uh, um, 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 so, sorry, I'm going to estimate all of these parameters. And this is also going to allow this thing to vary with volatility. But now I'm not using any information from options. I'm estimating this just by maximizing the likelihood of realized returns. Um, and that works well too. The likelihood is as high as before. Uh, the BIC actually prefers this, but it makes no difference for our main result. The slope of the pricing current is still significantly positively related to volatility. What I have mentioned up to now is all of this was in sample. You trade this, can, can an investor do this? Yeah, so this is actually a suggestion we got just on Monday when I gave another seminar. Um, so here's the same thing out of sample. Um, basically what we do is we estimate the pricing kernel on an expanding window using only information up to you know, time T. Then we form the uh, conditional physical density for the next 30 days. Uh, and, and we compute the likelihood this way. Uh, and you can see that the, the pricing kernel computed out of sample is still related to volatility in a very similar way. Admittedly, this becomes a little bit narrower, but the gap is still very large. Uh, and we're thinking about the best way to compute t-stats here because we use the bootstrap for the other results that we can't use here. Uh, but I think that should be straight, straightforward to figure out. And I believe it's, it looks like it's going to be significant still. OK, summary of the empirical results. Um, so it seems like as a function of returns, the pricing kernel becomes steeper when volatility is low. So that means that any given negative return is more painful to investors. Uh, and particularly, we showed you that when we scale the pricing kernel or we compute the pricing kernel as a function of standardized returns, which was that special case A0, B1, meaning as a function of standardized returns, it's time invariant, that that provides a very good fit to the data. Okay, so kind of as a stylized fact, you can take away the pricing kernel scales one-to-one -one with volatility. Okay? We've seen that the, the differences are large, they're significant, and they're robust to different ways of measuring the pricing kernel. Okay, now I hope that many of you will have ideas and thoughts on what to do with this. And it's, I know that it connects to a lot of things that we have not mentioned here yet. Uh, so we're, we're in the process of kind of try, trying to um, connect it to as many other things as we can. Uh, but what I want to do for the rest of today is to connect it to what equilibrium models imply. Um, one reason why this is very um, useful as a, as a way of thinking about equilibrium models is because these models are all about dynamics. Right? If you think about the habit or the long-run risk model, conditional that, that dynamics drive everything. Right? It's time variation and risk aversion in the habit model. It's time variation in economic growth rates in the long-run risk model. And they do a really good job of explaining asset prices, but it's really hard to assess whether that's the right mechanism because we usually can't see these dynamics. Now, what we have here is a dynamic finding about the pricing kernel. How does the pricing kernel move as a function of conditional volatility, which is pretty close to observable? And so it's very well suited to think about is are the dynamic mechanisms of these, um, of these asset pricing models realistic along this dimension? Okay, so that's what we'll do. Um, but as a, as a primary step, what I do before diving into any model is I'm going to show you um, a proposition that we derive uh, where we actually show what drives variation in the projected pricing curve. Okay, so that's the proposition here. Um, so for it, we're going to assume that the log pricing kernel and log returns are conditionally jointly normal. Okay, so it's, it's a simplification, but it's, for example, what would be true in the habit and long-run risk models. And when we do this, and I'm not going to show the proof, I'm just going to show the result, the slope of the projection, which is this here, is related to the following things. The volatility of the pricing kernel, not the projected pricing kernel, the pricing kernel itself, which is a multivariate object the volatility of returns, the correlation between returns and the pricing kernel, and the level of returns. So the slope is not the same everywhere. It's a curvy function. Okay. What do we learn here? Well, we learn when volatility of, of returns goes up. When the VIX is high, I'm dividing by a big number here, and the slope becomes flatter. The slope is negative because an equity premium requires the correlation to be negative. I, I think that's obvious. Uh, so it becomes less negative as I divide by a big number here. So this result says the pricing kernel should become flatter as volatility increases. Okay. Allow me to skip a couple of slides and remind you of the main result. That's exactly what we see in the data. So if return volatility goes up, the pricing kernel should become flatter. Why does it then not become flatter in the models? Well, something else has to change. So the other things that can change is the volatility of the pricing kernel itself, 
or its correlation with returns. So if, for example, returns become more volatile and the pricing kernel becomes proportionally more volatile, then this change, change will cancel and the slope of the, of the kernel will not change, of the projected kernel will not change as a long-run risk model. Okay, so what I do is I look at the relationship between these volatilities and the correlation in the models to understand why do they have a counterfactual prediction about the projection? Okay, let me try to be careful in, in explaining this graph. Um, so we want to relate again these three objects here, which jointly explain the slope of the projected pricing kernel. So I'll have the return volatility on the x axis. And the other two objects are on the two y axes. So the volatility of the pricing kernel is going to be on the left y axis. Okay, so that's the uh, the, the black line here. And the correlation between uh, returns and the pricing kernel is going to be on the right uh, y axis. And I've computed them for both of these models. Okay, so let me actually start on the right. Um, so in the Banzai Yaron model, the correlation between returns and the pricing kernel is nearly time invariant. What does change is the volatility of the pricing kernel goes up as returns become more volatile. And they do so roughly in a proportional manner. So if you were to continue this, this is roughly, roughly proportional. Okay, what does that mean? That means when returns become more volatile and the pricing kernel becomes more volatile in a proportional way, this is going to cancel out. The slope of the projection is not going to change as a function of return volatility. That's what we saw here. Okay. How about Campbell Cochrane? Same thing happens with the volatility of the pricing kernel. It increases as returns become more volatile. But now at the same time, returns in the pricing kernel become more correlated. So there are now two effects that push me in the wrong direction. And jointly, they mean that the pricing kernel now moves in the wrong direction. Now, this is just a statistical mathematical fact. So th th this result is directly applicable to these models because they are conditionally jointly log normal. There's no economics yet. Okay, so how does this connect to the economics of the models? And that's the last thing I want to argue, and it's going to take a second. I'm going to try to walk you through in detail. Um, so let's look at the habit model. And the way I want to do this, I'm going to rely exactly on how John Cochrane explains his model. So this is both this figure and this quote is taken from his survey on macro finance. So let me first read out the quote. Okay, so one of the habit models functions has been to point out how predictability, volatility, and time varying risk aversion and risk premium are really the same. Put differently, the habit mechanism jointly explains all these things. Let me try to argue that this is also the reason why the model does this. And that's actually needed for the model to have any in interesting economic implications. Okay, so to do this, let's go to this graph. This is how uh, he explains the mechanism of the model. So the utility function is similar to a CRRA utility function with the difference that we don't evaluate consumption Reevaluate consumption relative to some habit level that's called X here. And this habit level changes over time. So what that means is when consumption is really close to the habit, this utility function becomes really steep. Another way of saying this is risk aversion increases. Okay, how do I see this? Imagine any given shock in consumption of any given magnitude, and we want to compare kind of these two red uh, arrows here. So if you're if consumption is far away from the habit, good times, I'm doing well right now, then any given consumption shock is not going to move utility very much. But the same magnitude of a consumption shock is going to have a large effect on utility over here, which is to say utility changes is more volatile as a function of consumption, so risk aversion is higher and more sensitive. Okay. Why is this important in the model? Well, when risk aversion is high, I'm discounting future cash flows more, so the price dividend ratio is lower. That's the case because dividends never change. They always have the same conditional distribution. I'm just discounting them more now due to my higher risk aversion. And so that means that the price dividend ratio predicts future expected future excess returns. That's the predictability part of what the model actually explains. It explains one more thing, which is time varying volatility. Okay, where does this come from? Well, the, there's a similar graph for the price dividend ratio. It also becomes more sensitive to consumption as you're closer to the habit. So that means there's excess volatility in the price dividend ratio and therefore in returns, returns are more volatile than dividends. That's how you explain counter cyclical volatility in the model. These are the two things that the model wants to explain. But it does not want to explain the equity premium. For that, it needs risk aversion of 200, right? That's Mara Prescott, there's nothing new here. These are the two things that it explains. 
And obviously this relies on time varying risk aversion. Now, how does this connect to my finding? Well, the pricing kernel becomes more volatile as you move to the left here. Returns also become more volatile as you move to the left because the price dividend ratio also becomes more sensitive to consumption shocks. And because they're both more sensitive consumption shocks, they're more correlated with one another. Okay. That's this graph. Returns and the pricing kernel become more volatile, uh, become more correlated uh, when volatility is high because volatility is high when risk aversion is high. It is all the same thing in the model. Right? So the mechanism itself is what produces this here. You can't really get rid of this without fundamentally changing the mechanism of the model. OK, let's, uh, let's try to talk about Bansal Yaron. Um, there are many equations in Bansal Yaron, and I don't uh, want to put all of them on the slide. So I'm going to wave my hands a little bit, but I think many of you will have seen this model. Um, so there's a consumption in the dividend process. Um, both of them have separate shocks. These are normal shocks. Um, and both of them are subject to variation in the conditional mean, that's the XT, same XT, and time variation in the conditional volatility, that's the sigma T. Okay? And as a result of this, and as a result of the agent caring about these persistent shocks, Epstein-Zinn, the pricing kernel looks like this. Okay? So there, there's an expectation, and then there are innovations, and there are three innovations. Consumption shocks, I don't like negative consumption. I don't like it when the long-term growth rate of consumption declines. And I don't like it when consumption becomes more volatile. Okay, let me explain. So what does this model want to explain? Mainly the equity premium. How does it do that? So if there's a shock, let me just focus on one channel. Okay, so there are obviously these three sources. Consumption is basically irrelevant in the model. X and sigma are what drive everything. Okay, let me focus on sigma. When there's a positive shock to sigma, volatility increases, macroeconomic uncertainty increases. This increases the pricing kernel because the agent doesn't like this. How does this explain the equity premium? Well, dividends become more volatile at the same time because they are subject to the same volatility shocks. That's the same process, which is to say um, dividends become less attractive exactly when marginal utility is high. That's why there's an equity premium. Okay. Well, in this model, that's what explains half of the equity premium. The other half comes from the equivalent X channel. Okay. Now, how does this relate to my finding? Well, when sigma increases, consumption becomes more volatile. When consumption becomes more volatile, the pricing kernel becomes more volatile because it's a function of consumption. You can actually show this analytically. At the same time, dividends become more volatile and therefore returns become more volatile. The price dividend ratio is a function of sigma as well which means when the volatility of the pricing kernel goes up, the volatility of returns goes up. The fact that they do this simultaneously is exactly why there is an equity premium, right? If there was a separate volatility process here, it would not carry a risk premium because it wouldn't enter the pricing kernel. Okay? So they are basically proportional because they rely on the same process. Well, that's why this doesn't move. Why does it not move? Because if I go back to my formula, this exactly cancels here. The pricing kernel doesn't move this volatility because volatility affects the pricing kernel and returns in exactly the same way. That's how the model explains the equity premium. You can't fix this. Wait a minute, but there's the X channel. Okay. How about we just get rid of volatility, make volatility constant. We can still somehow explain the equity premium based on just time variation in X, because that explains half of it. Let's just scale this up. Okay. What's the problem with this is there was a paper that I don't know how many of you are in this literature, but by John Campbell and a student of John Campbell that said, well, if you have two persistent X, then the variance ratios of consumption become really big. And we don't see this in the data. We don't believe your X channel. And as a response to this criticism, Banzal Yaron offered a new calibration of their model where they downplayed X and they said, everything comes from Sigma. But Sigma is exactly what causes the problem that I'm documenting which means there is no real way of, of rescuing this mechanism, at least not if you, if you buy my evidence and, and the, the Campbell-Beeler evidence. Right, how about some other models? These are pretty simplistic models. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let me start on the right. How about we add some non-normal shocks to the models? Right, so there's a, a nice uh, JPE paper by Beckett and Engstrom that take a habit model and they add some non-normal shocks to it. Um, as a result of this, uh, the pricing kernel now barely moves this volatility. Remember the habit model, it did move this volatility just in the wrong direction. So now it's basically time invariant uh, for the same reasons. 
the, the volatility is proportional, the correlation goes down. Okay, so it doesn't really get us to where we need to go. Same thing in the long run risk model. You add some jumps. What does this do? So now the correlation also actually becomes more negative as volatility increases because these jumps are joined, uh, joined in consumption and dividends. They affect everything the same, same way. Uh, and so this doesn't help. It's still basically in time variant, even though the pricing current is now more nonlinear. Okay. What about other frameworks? How about time varying disaster risk? Or how about time varying household risk in incomplete markets? Both of these, these uh, frameworks, some of you may know these, combine Epstein's and preferences with shocks to a persistent state variable. So they are basically long run risk models, long run risk baked into either the disaster mechanism or into the incomplete market mechanism. And it works very similarly. The volatility of the pricing kernel in returns is proportional in both cases. And as a result, the pricing kernel doesn't move as a function of volatility. Okay. There's the puzzle. Okay. Uh, what I think needs to be done to resolve this puzzle, I think it's going to be challenging with most of these models. I think the main issue is that the volatility of the pricing kernel is too closely connected to the volatility of returns. Financial market volatility is not all that correlated with the macro economy. There are different empirical studies that have shown this. Uh, Ian Dubecker, who I think is also in the audience, has different papers basically showing that volatility risk isn't priced. Why is it not priced? Because it's not in the pricing curve. Totally consistent with what I'm showing here. Okay, So I think what we need to do is we need to develop a mechanism for the equity premium and for return predictability that does not rely on financial market volatility, as it does in all of these models. Um, you all go and think about this. Uh, I, I, I think this is an, an interesting challenge and I think it's doable. Uh, I don't see a good way of doing it in, in these benchmark models, uh, but there are other mechanisms that explain the equity premium without any time version in volatility. And maybe they can be extended to, to explain what we have here. 45 minutes, I'm done, but I'm uh, happy to take questions. All right, thanks very much. At this point, um, I'd like to invite anyone who has a question to feel free to unmute yourself and use your microphone. Can I ask a question? Go, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. So I wanted to know whether this mod, this this can be used for uh, finding out uh, the option pricing in India. This model, you, kernel model. You cut out a little bit. Are you asking, is this helpful for finding out option pricing in these equilibrium models? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Um, so in order to compute these things, I skipped a lot of details. In order to get this, I need risk neutral probabilities and I need physical probabilities. The way I get risk neutral is I compute option prices, Frieden Litzenberger and get this. So I have computed option prices uh, and in some models they look okay and others they don't. Um, I have another paper where I do something similar. So if you want to look at option prices, um, then I would point you to uh, my paper with Tyler Beeson, who's also here, who's my PhD student, uh, where we look at option prices very explicitly in these models and, and show where it works and where it doesn't work and how this is related to the equity premium. I'm not sure if that addresses what you were after. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Right, other comments or questions here. I'm sure that we have overlooked a lot of connections with other work. This is this really early stage. And so if you, if you have anything in mind, I would be uh, really uh, happy to hear about it. Uh, David, uh, Steve Bluski here. Uh, very interesting work. Um, you, I, I'd like to understand what the role of the VIX is in your model. Are you taking VIX as being the market's volatility? Um, and I find the VIX is a problematical variable. I haven't done a whole lot of study of myself. A lot of other people listening today probably have done as, as much. But the VIX involves both the at the money implied vol and also the slope of the, the uh, volatility smile. And I, I'm not, it's not just the market's estimate of generic volatility, it's got a whole structure to it. And I'm wondering how that goes into your model. Okay. So back to this slide. So this is how the, the VIX enters our pricing kernel model. 
um, it enters as a linear function. So this is going to be uh, empirically proxied by the VIX. Uh, and this is, as you can see, an affine function. Um, and so if, for example, the VIX is always 10% higher than conditional volatility, let's say as an example, because it carries mm -hmm. a risk premium, then I can just scale this down by picking a parameter that's slightly less than one or by picking a negative value for A. So as long as the risk premium is a linear function of volatility itself, we would be fine. What we should probably also do as a robustness check is to estimate a time series model like a Gartsch model and use this as an alternative. I don't imagine that this makes a big difference, again, be because this, this functional form can absorb any linear transformation here. Is that helpful? Well, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you're allowing the, the parameters of your pricing kernel to be time varying, but it sounds like you're assuming that the risk premium on the volatility in, embedded in the VIX is not time varying. That is correct. Sorry, um, I'm not assuming that it's not time varying. I'm assuming that it's a linear function of volatility. So it, it, if it's proportional, like again, if the VIX is always 10% higher, then I just pick this as you know roughly 0.9 and I'm fine again. But yeah, you, but sometimes, I, it, sometimes if it's 10%, sometimes if it's 20%, and sometimes it's 2%, is that accounted for in the structure of your model? No, so the only, again, only if it's proportional to volatility or, or uh -huh. a linear function, I should say. So if, for example, sometimes, uh, let's say physical volatility is 20% and risk neutral is 22, and sometimes physical volatility is 20 and risk neutral is 25, that I wouldn't capture. Mm -hmm. So what we should do in order to convince you that our finding is robust to this issue is, again, to estimate a time series model and stick in that conditional volatility estimate from a time series model uh, in here and, and do everything else the same, I think. Is that, would that be Perhaps. fair? Perhaps so, but I'd be also interested in seeing what other kind of non-financial type variables might go into this volatility risk premium and in, in term, and into the pricing kernel itself. Uh, seems to me that we, we very much restrict our focus to things that are uh, you know, um, uh, profit maximizing, uh, uh, utility maximizer, et cetera, et cetera, and leaving out maybe the kinds of things that actual human beings do and that we could get some observations on, but aren't really part of the standard, the standard model. Uh, yes, thank you. So two part response. Uh, Partially, we've done this by incorporating these other macro covariates, but yes, uh -huh, there yeah. are also there are also prices. I know I noticed that. So part of your question was we should incorporate other things. Um, no, but that was so, good. I like. Uh, I mean, this roughly is like monetary policy, right? So short rate term spread, monetary yeah. policy may affect the shape of the pricing kernel, and it probably does because we can see that the fit actually becomes better, right? But because the our main object of interest was not to estimate the pricing kernel as well as possible. Right? I could have a more complex functional form. I want to keep it simple. I just want to convince you that it changes as a function of volatility. That is not to say that it doesn't also change with other things. And that would also be interesting. But we actually saw a similar paper, again, in this workshop, maybe about two months ago, by a PhD student from Houston. And he did something like this as well, which we saw also. And so we thought, let's just scale that back a little bit, because that's we were working on it at the same time. And at the mm -hmm. time, we were actually thinking to push this more. Uh, but then we thought we don't really need it for our main result. And he has written a paper that's very nice on this already. So let him explore these details, and we we'll use it as a robustness test. That's one reason why we kind of scaled back a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So no one, else, and one last follow up on that. Did you use alternative as to uh, uh, measures of the sigma t? For example, you could have used a historical, you know, 30 day vol or something like that and see whether that gave a different that in, in, in theory that should uh, if if uh, the VIX is proportional to actual volatility, if you put actual volatility in, you should get the same answers. But it didn't sound like you tried that. Uh, we had tried this in a very old specification month ago, 
Uh, but uh -huh. again, I think that using uh, like historical, let's say intra-daily or daily or using a time series model would be a good uh, robustness check that we should add, I think. It, I think mm -hmm. that's related to your earlier comment, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll do that. Thank you. Uh, che, go ahead and shout out your question. Yeah, hi, David. Uh, I'm just curious, I, you fo you, you're focusing mostly on the left-hand side, but I'm curious, what do you find on the right-hand side of the return and especially the error bounds? So essentially, uh, do you have more U-shaped essentially when the volatility is lower? Is that what yep. you're getting? So yes, it is very symmetric. So we get a very strong U-shape. Uh, the reason why I didn't show this is because I didn't want all of you to become distracted and think about the U-shape. I wanted you to think about something new, and so I cut it off at zero. Uh, but we do find that, so if I can use my hands, the whole U uh, kind of does this here. So yeah. it's very symmetric on the right-hand side, um, which again, the U-shape isn't new. Uh, and so therefore, I try to kind of push this to the side. Yeah, I'm just curious to see the error bounds on the right-hand side, whether they really... I would expect the gap to be much smaller than the negative return side. And I see. that's why I'm curious to see whether you get a really significantly different error bounds between the two. So that I can, so I, I, it's a very good suggestion. So in the paper, we have added 95% confidence intervals around the two estimates, but we have actually never tried that on the right-hand side. We had but that's a the different right -hand side before. Yeah, yeah no, but it, I mean, sure. Maybe like we showed this in the appendix as an aside or so. It's, it's interesting. Thank you. I've not yet looked at the chat. There are 10 things in there. I assume that uh, Tobias has maybe answered some of them. So, well, I, 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 I read some of them to you and Tobias answered some of them. Um, so I think we're good as far as the chat's concerned. Um, and, and if I, and if, and if I, if I did a bad job reading your question from the chat, please feel free to jump in and shout it out. Anyway, any other questions? Uh, I actually have uh, one comment. Uh, so I think uh, your finding is uh, is very interesting, and uh, but I think a very natural explanation for it would uh, would be like any kind of learning model. So if you augment, uh, uh, say, a long run risk model with uh, learning or a habit model with learning, you would be able to generate this type of reactions because if you think that in times of low, even times of low volatility, uh, you observe. Uh, a significant negative shock, uh, then uh, uh, this is actually going to be painful for you because it increases uh, future and uh, uh, uncertainty about the future. And uh, uh, if you would observe this type of shock during uh, the, the, the times, uh, during the bad times, then it wouldn't have like as much effect uh, because uh, uh, that would be uh, consistent with your bad state. So uh, I think that's uh, uh, one potential explanation, which uh, uh, might, uh, uh, at least theoretically, I'm not sure how things would work like structurally, but at least theoretically, that's something which could explain, uh, I think, the, your findings. I 100% agree. That's very much my intuition, is that the, the minus 10% carries more macroeconomic news when it happens when volatility is low. And so there's more updating, right? If you're a Bayesian learner, there's more updating. I'm now learning something bad has happened. Whereas if I sit in 2008 and I see the market drop 10%, I already knew I was in a bad state. And volatility goes all over the place anyways. Returns go up and down, up and down. The VIX is at 100. And so seeing minus 10% in 2008 may not carry as much new information. So I think the learning uh, channel is, is very much what I'm thinking too may explain this. Um, so what we are hoping to do next is kind of to explore this empirically, actually. Uh, I don't think we want to propose a solution. We want somebody else to show a solution. Uh, but we would like to show what we can say empirically about what drives our results. And the learning thing is exactly what, what, what we have in mind, what we want to look at. So any other questions?